I wanted just to, to give you all uh, a little update about what's going on at Southeastern Children's Home. Uh, maybe give some of you all uh, a brief introduction to what Southeastern Children's Home is and, and what we do. And then I'm going to open it up and let you all ask questions. And uh, we'll, we'll let the last uh, 15 minutes or 20 minutes just be kind of a question and answer. So if you're thinking about some questions that you may have, and, and I'll be um, more than happy to answer those as, as best I can. Um, just to let you know, yesterday was a crazy busy day. And I know y'all have been uh, receiving some rain just like we have down in, in Greenville and, and Duncan. But yesterday we had a charity golf tournament for the children's home. And uh, of the five years that I've been with the children's home, we've been blessed with really good weather at every golf tournament we've had. But yesterday was not great golf weather. And, and uh, it was cold. It was wet. Um, as I was going out, uh, getting prepared for the golf tournament in the morning, um, clearly the clothes that I had were not uh, water repellent, and so by by the time the golf tournament has started, I was I was already soaked to the bone. In fact, I even went uh, went home and found some more clothes and came back, and and uh, we spent the entire day at the golf course, and so we finally left around uh, seven in the evening. Well, we had a great day. We raised a lot of money for the children's home, uh, but it was a tiring day. So I feel like I'm kind of back to back. Um, I, I don't feel like there was a whole lot of rest yesterday. So uh, pardon me if I'm, I'm a little bit uh, slow or, or not uh, quite on top of it this morning. But uh, let's just start with a prayer, if you will. Father, thank you so much for this um, opportunity to come this Sunday morning and to be able to worship and be able to fellowship with other Christians. We ask that you help us all be able to uh, be a light here in this dark world, and that you'll be able to uh, guide us and, and help us make the right decisions. And this morning uh, in this Bible class, just help us all be able to um, somehow lift each other up. And as Christians brothers and, and Christian sisters, let us um, be able to unite, to, to have a common good so that others can... Um, see you in the works that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So a little bit about Southeastern. Once again, I know that this congregation has had a long history with Southeastern Children's Home. In fact, y'all do perhaps, um, y'all are continually one of the top churches in the Change for Children program that we have. And that's not just churches in North Carolina. I mean, that's churches everywhere. Y'all do a tremendous job. And so thank you so much for um, being part of that campaign. I know that's something that, that maybe uh, seems small. I mean, just pennies and dimes and nickels and quarters, um, but it adds up to a lot. And in fact, uh, this year, I expect that, that we'll have almost $10,000 generated just from the Change for Children campaign. And this church does an amazing job with that. So let me just say thank you, um, and thank you to to Bill and, and Karen Fitzpatrick, um, both of those individuals are um, core members of what we do at Southeastern. If y'all didn't know, Bill's currently our chairman of the board at Southeastern Children's Home, uh, and Karen does her counseling work kind of under the umbrella of Southeastern. Um, and so the, the Fitzpatricks are tremendous assets. So thank you for loaning uh, the Fitzpatricks to us in, in, uh, in some way. Uh, for those of y'all who like I said, um, do know about the Children's Home. Just kind of take this as a small commercial, but the Children's Home was created in around the mid-60s by brothers um, of the Churches of Christ who met and saw that there was a need for um, finding a place for abused and neglected children uh, in the Carolinas. And so initially in the 60s, they created uh, what was basically a foster home. We had a, a, a several foster homes located throughout South Carolina. Uh, at one point, we had one in Lexington. We had one in Sumter, South Carolina. Um, and money was uh, raised in order to pay those parents to continue to have foster children. That continued until about the mid-'80s. It was in the mid-'80s that uh, the Children's Home was able to secure a piece of property in Duncan, South Carolina. Uh, as the crow flies, I guess Duncan's about 45 miles south of here. It takes about an hour to get there. Um, the campus we have is about a 55-acre campus. It used to be a, a peach farm, um, which 
I grew up in peach country down in uh, Batesburg, South Carolina, Rich Spring, South Carolina. Uh, and I used to think that um, upstate didn't have any peaches, but apparently they did. And, and uh, although these peaches weren't used for uh, selling on the side of the road, they used these for uh, uh, baby food for whatever reason. I guess there's certain quality of peaches. But it used to be a peach orchard, 55 acres, and it's got a lake. Um, it, it's, it's a beautiful location. It sits where we can actually see uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and so uh, there in the distance, uh, the sunsets are, are amazing, the sunrises are amazing. Uh, we have three cottages at the children's home. We have two that are located on campus. Uh, the two that are located on campus, we have a functional capacity of six kids per house. When I say functional capacity, they're big houses. We could we're actually licensed for more than just six in each house. But what we found is if you put more than six children in a house, it runs our house parents away. I mean, just, it just, uh, um, it, 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 that's right, you get crazy. That's right. So it uh, becomes a little bit uh, problematic. And you, you can imagine, um, even with six children uh, in a house, that things become a little bit difficult. Um, um, things like going to church in the morning. Uh, you can't just hop in a sedan and put uh, your wife and, and six kids in, in a, you know, whatever, a Chevy Cruze and, and get to church. You have to have a, a minivan, or sometimes we actually have a bus, uh, depending on the size of the family, that, that we have to take to go to church. Imagine going to the grocery store. Uh, when, all of a sudden, when you're buying for a large family, it becomes a little bit problematic. Our house parents, um, and I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but we employ house parents in each cottage. That makes us different than almost any children's home in South or North Carolina. And let me tell you why. First of all, there's a lot of children's homes that are in the Carolinas. Um, and and they, they do good work. But there's levels of children's homes. And, and the easiest way to describe it is you have foster care, kind of the base level where children go when they're usually uh, pulled from homes. Foster homes are great. Uh, I grew up in a foster home, though not a foster child myself. My parents took in foster children. And, and foster homes are, are wonderful places for uh, children to be able to kind of develop uh, the skills and, and um, have the love that, that, that a family gives. Unfortunately, not every child is best suited for a foster home. They're sim simply children that have high needs that um, can't be met in a foster home. And so that's a lot of the reason that we have uh, group homes in the Carolinas. And a level one group home is really a place where kids can go uh, before their um, transition to a foster home. So level one group homes are basically kids that may be rough around the edges, but they're just kind of waiting for a foster home to open up, and, and then they'll move them in. And then we have level two group homes. That's what Southeastern Children's Home is. We're a uh, mid-management facility. And what that basically means is there are some kids out there that have had such abuse and neglect that they don't function well in foster homes, okay? They need uh, specific therapeutic help in order to kind of rehabilitate themselves. Um, and so the children's home is uh, specifically designed to help those children that, uh, to recover from some of the issues they've had earlier in their childhood. So for instance, we have, um, it's not just a group home. We have therapists that come and do um, therapy with our children every week. Um, we have group therapy, uh, meaning all the kids get together uh, and they do a group therapy program once every week. Uh, they have a Bible study every week with uh, one of the, with our campus minister who happens to be a youth minister at Central Church of Christ in Spartanburg. Um, so we do all sorts of different therapies with them uh, that normally a, a, a level one group home may not do. But the other part that makes us special is the house parent model. Any one of us could go and create a children's home tomorrow if we wanted. And the most reasonable way to create a children's home, if, if you and I were just creating one, um, and the most efficient way would be to go hire minimum wage employees on three shifts. So just like you would for a manufacturing plant, um, there's a lot of children's homes that, that go hire uh, first shift, second shift, and third shift. 
employees to basically watch over the children. Well, and I don't really mean to, to put down the agencies that do that, because they serve a, a certain purpose. However, we feel that it is best, and the board of directors has felt that it is best for the children to have a mother and a father that's full time um, watching over them. So we actually employ um, a house parent model. I mean, we, every house has a set of house parents that the Southeastern Children's Home pays. They live in the house, and then there are separate rooms that the children live in. In fact, I would encourage this church, y'all aren't that far away. If you haven't had the opportunity to come to the children's home and to see what uh, the environment is that the children are living in, come down. If y'all want to come down as a group, that's great. If you want to come down individually, come down. Uh, every day is open house at Southeastern Children's Home. Um, in fact, uh, just the other day, I was driving through campus, and I saw a car that I didn't recognize, and it turns out it was just a neighbor coming to fish on our pond down there. And, uh, um, but we open up our campus to everybody. There aren't any gates. There aren't any fences. Uh, you can drive on in, and we just ask, like any other neighbor, just give us a call and let us know. Uh, but the, the children's home is set up to give the children the best set of tools um, that they need in order to be healthy, happy, productive adults. Because the children that come into our services, however they leave, meaning they could leave through adoption, they might leave by having a foster family take them in, they might leave um, from having a, a family member, you know, an aunt or uncle or distant cousin decide that, that they're willing to take them in, or they might just age out, um, meaning they get to be 21 years old, they said, that person's an adult. They need to uh, learn to fly. So however they leave our program, they become members of our community, meaning they're people that are living right here among us. Um, and most of the children that are part of our program don't tend to move to Alaska and Hawaii. They, they tend to, to stay right here, because this is the home that they know. This is where they end up getting jobs. So in many ways, we're helping the community. I mean, we are directly servicing you um, by taking care of these children uh, that no one else will take care of. So that's a little bit about who we are and what we do. Most of our children uh, were licensed for ages 12 through 20, which means that, um, in fact, right now we have two 13-year-olds uh, that are pretty young. They go to a public school. Um, all of the house parents uh, attend a church of Christ, and so this morning, every one of our kids is at a church. Um, two of our um, houses attend a church in Greenville, and one attends a church in Spartanburg. Um, they attend youth group functions. Um, they, we try to make life for them as normal as possible as it can be uh, in a group home, so especially in regards to uh, things like school and church. You wouldn't know a children's home kid from, from any other kid. In fact, uh, before I started working at the children's home, I had volunteered at Palmetto Bible Camp. And uh, um, I, I can't remember if I've told this story when I was here before, but the, uh, as a counselor for the, the cabin, there was this one kid who just was a great kid. I mean, he stood out, um, perhaps because he was a little bit older than some of the kids in my cabin. but. Uh, just a really good kid and it came to Saturday when we were, uh, all the parents come and pick up their kids and I kept looking for this boy's parents and kept looking for this boy's parents and, and uh, um, never, never saw him check out, never saw him check out and finally it was uh, one of the house parents that came up and said hey Philip, um, just want to let you know, you know we've got this young boy and I thought oh I mean, he's, he lives at the children's home. I said, oh, yeah, you didn't know that? I said, no, I had no idea. Um, you know, to me, he was just a, um, another 10, 11-year-old boy, uh, whatever, there at camp. I guess he was 12. But a uh, 12-year-old boy at camp and a group of 11-year-old boys. Um, and then I found out that boy's story later on when I came to work at the children's home. And that boy's story was basically, as a young child, his natural parents um, didn't take care of him. It, and I say didn't take care of them, 
they didn't pay him any attention. They didn't give him the, the tools that he needed to be a, a, a healthy young boy. Um, bathroom facilities, he just had a Folgers can in the corner uh, to use the restroom. The parents didn't feed him, so he had to eat the crumbs from the dog food bowl that the dog wouldn't eat. So when he became uh, about four or five years old, um, and so I, the parents knew that he needed to go to school and it was free daycare or whatever, and so they, they put him to school and, and you know he wasn't, uh, he wasn't like the normal kid. He wasn't talking like a five-year-old should be able to talk. He didn't have the social skills that a five-year-old should have. Um, and the teachers caught on pretty quick. Um, they called the Department of Social Service services went out, saw the house, saw the living conditions, and uh, removed the young man from his home. Uh, later on, the parental rights were terminated for both the mother and father because essentially they just weren't uh, mentally equipped to take care of a child. So this young boy became an orphan uh, at about the age of six or seven, um, and so he was in foster care for a while. Um, finally, there was an adoptive family agreed to adopt this young man. And so um, this family already had three or four other kids. And um, I'm also an attorney as well, uh, which is great when I'm here in North Carolina, because if it comes to North Carolina law, I cannot help you. So, uh, um, <laughs> but uh, in South Carolina, um, even with the children's home, I still do a lot of adoptions. I help people that are adopting kids through the foster care system. Uh, or help um, people that are uh, connected in the church uh, that are adopting kids. And um, I wasn't there at this adoption, but I'm familiar enough with adoptions to know exactly you know, the type of questions that a judge asks. And the judge is going to ask questions like, are you willing to, I mean, when he asked the adopted parent, you know, are you willing to take this child and, and make this child as one of your own? You're going to care for them, um, you know, even after high school and, and uh, anyhow. So the parents adopted this young man, and uh, it probably went on for maybe eight months, and, and the parents just, um, because he had some, some, some issues, I don't want to call them disabilities, but he just didn't have the childhood that most of us would have had. And uh, so the, about six to eight months later, the parents went back to DSS with him right beside them and said, we can't take him anymore, and left and turned around and, and just left out of the office. Of course, this boy who can remember his mother and father um, and, and, and knows enough to know that they're not his mother and father, gets adopted, has this huge mountaintop you know, experience. Hey, you know, I'm wanted, I'm special. And then he gets returned like a used book or DVD or whatever. You know? um, and so his, his heart was broken. He bounced from foster home to foster home until finally, when he was 12 years old, he was placed at Southeastern Children's Home. Um, and at Southeastern Children's Home, he, he received the same treatment that every other child would see, meaning he, he had a mom and a dad, uh, Adam and Alyssa Cooper. Uh, good friends of mine were, were his house parents. And uh, he got to be part of a family. And he grew up and, and really matured a lot in the, the year or two that he was with us. Um, the really cool part about his story, though, is that uh, while he was with us, um, there was a, a person who's kind of connected to our agency, a volunteer, um, who um, fell in love with this young boy. He adopted him. And so um, it's, it's, it's kind of cool, but he, he lives right in Inman, South Carolina. And he's got an adoptive family that loves him. Um, comes back every now and then just to visit and just to go fish in the lake and um, you know it's kind of one of those stories where he's mm, let's see he'll be graduating this year so he's I think 18 years old now and uh, you know, here's a young man that went from eating crumbs off his kitchen floor being unwanted to all of a sudden being loved and, and having a home and, and now I, I don't know you know what his plans are, but my guess, he'll be going to college. Um, he'll be finding a job, and good chance he could be one of our neighbors. Um, to be honest with you, that's the kind of guy that I want living right next to me. Um, so that's a little bit about 
kind of what we do. A little bit about what Southeastern Children's Home is all about. Um, obviously, um, most of the kids that come to us are not in the best situation. Um, so we have to kind of surround them with staff and with people that are there to help them. Uh, we have a mentoring program where uh, many of our kids are teamed up with a, a Christian role model that basically helps them feel special, if you will. So it takes them out of the group home during a Saturday afternoon. It might take them to the movies or, or uh, you know, um, sends them text or, or a Facebook message just saying, hey, I'm thinking about you. And so that, that's uh, a relatively new program that we've started at the Children's Home, and that's been fairly successful so far. Um, also, though, many of our kids are a little bit behind in school. You can imagine if you're being moved from foster home to foster home to foster home um, that your school credits won't transfer. I mean, you might be taking you know, Spanish at one school and you move to another school, they don't offer Spanish, they only offer French. And so you lose all the, the credits that you may have earned. So it's not uncommon for us to have a 16-year-old boy or girl who's a freshman in high school or all the other freshmen are you know, 12 years old or 13 years old. Um, so we actually employ tutors to come in and work with our kids to try and get them up to speed. Um, our program is designed such that every kid has to be in school. Um, that can be high school, that can be college. We have two kids right now that are attending a lo local community college. Um, they're both about 19, or actually the young lady 17 years old. Uh, the young boy is 18 years old. Um, but you have to be attending school to be part of our program. Um, as you get older, um, you're able to have a little bit more uh, freedom. I mean, you have a job. A lot of our kids work part-time jobs. We've got um, a young lady that's going to college. She works as a waitress at a local restaurant. Um, the young man that's going to college, he uh, works for a um, local guy that does a lot of landscaping. Got another kid who um, is working on his GED right now. He's probably about 16 years old, but just like as I mentioned, he's just, uh, it's probably not a good fit for him to go back to public school. And he's really a very bright young boy. So he's working on his GED so that he can eventually go to uh, one of the local community colleges. And he's working at McDonald's right there in Duncan. Um, so as they age and as they mature, uh, they, they get certain luxuries that maybe uh, they didn't have when they were younger, just like any kid would. Um, we do use a, a system of rewards for our kids that, that tries to um, help them make good decisions. And so what we do is we actually track their behavior. And so the better behavior uh, they have each day means they get a better score at the end of the week. And based on their score, they get certain um, privileges. So for instance, if they've been a good kid, they haven't, you know, they've done their homework and, and they haven't uh, back-talked their parents and they've done all their chores, um, then they might be able to stay up uh, later that evening or they might be able to make phone calls. Uh, or if they're really good, we actually let them have cell phones. So our, our kids, just like every other 16-year-old out there, um, and, and so, uh, <laughs> Some of y'all might think that's not a very good privilege. <laughs> but, uh, but our kids, they, they love that idea. So um, our goal is, is to get our children to the point where they can be independent. And I guess that's the goal of every parent uh, to, to some degree. But, but we have a specific uh, model set up where, where we really try to work our children through a process. So that's not just a process of maturation. Um, I mean, there's also a spiritual process uh, as well. Uh, we've had eight baptisms in the last year uh, at the children's home, now, which says a lot. Because um, I told you we had a functional capacity of six children in the uh, group homes on campus. We have a capacity of four on our off-campus housing means a total of 16 maximum children at, at one time. It's rare that we have 16 children at one time. A lot of that's just because kids are moving in and out. In fact, right now, um, I'll tell you that too. So let me tell you where we are right now. 
last month has been a tough month at the children's home. One of our house parents had uh, some pain in his back the other day. It just felt like it was his kidney uh, that was hurting him. And so he goes into the hospital, and uh, turns out it was his spleen. His spleen was enlarged and infected, and they did some tests and, and pretty quickly found out that he had leukemia. Um, and so uh, his name is Brian Conway. And, uh, Brian was moved to the Greenville Memorial and pretty quickly underwent um, chemotherapy. He was at Greenville Memorial for about three weeks and went through the first stage of chemo. They did tests and said, it's not working. So Brian, uh, a week and a half ago, I guess, we put Brian on a plane. And he's up in Seattle, Washington, uh, at a hospital up there undergoing treatment. And uh, I would just ask you all remember Brian in your prayers. Um, it's a tough time for, for the Conway family. Uh, Brian and Kelly had a daughter, Kara, that was living with them. And so Kara's been moved uh, from Duncan to go live with an aunt and uncle in Fort Worth. This has all happened within the last you know, three weeks. I mean, just last Saturday, uh, we were putting all their stuff on a U-Haul trailer uh, to go to a storage facility out in Texas where they're from. But they've been house parents with us for uh, over three years now. Um, and so, you know, here I'm talking about the stability that we try to give our children. Uh, you can imagine it's been a little bit of a tumultuous time for them. So because of that, we've also reduced numbers a little bit because we've had substitute house parents coming in uh, and taking care of that cottage so we don't have 16 kids right now we have in the house that that could have six we have three right now um, and so uh, you know that's just what it is hopefully we're on the search right now for, for finding house parents so uh, uh, we've interviewed a, a, a few people by the phone uh, we're it is hard to find people that are willing to give up everything they have, both the husband and wife, um, leave their jobs and go to Duncan, South Carolina to, to work in a children's home. It's a very thankless job. Um, you can imagine all the kids are not nice all the time. I mean, teaching is a tough job. My wife is uh, as a teacher, and, and, and that's tough. But, but when you're actually having to live with them and, and deal with the, the nastiness that some of them had, you know, it's just, it is a tough job. And uh, um, even though we have an amazing support system set up through the Carolinas, um, it's not one of the jobs that you're going to get rich doing either. Uh, so it's, some, it's one of those jobs you really have to love. So we're on the search right now to find a, a new set of house parents for the Sin Cottage. Um, but that's caused, caused a little bit of a heartache and a little bit of a problem there at the children's home. And uh, it's not something that I go around, you're probably not going to see in a newsletter, um, so, but it is what it is. And that, those are the kind of problems that we have to deal with uh, on a daily basis. All right, that's enough of me talking for a while. Um, does anybody have questions about the children's home or what the children's home does or, or any of the, the current situation with the children's home? Go ahead. We try and keep the ages pretty close together. So for instance, we have two girls' homes and one boys' home. So uh, the girls' home on campus, we try to keep the ages from about 12 to 17. And then for the off-campus girls' home, we try to keep the ages there from about 16 to 20. So it's a little bit, um, sometimes uh, there might be a 19-year-old that goes to the younger home just because we don't have a spot in our older home and we just have to wait till one spot comes open before we move them over. But we try to keep them a little bit um, around the same age. Our boys tend to be, uh, be teenagers. We rarely keep our, our boys beyond 19 or 20 years old. We have a young man right now, though, who uh, graduated high school last year. He's going to community college. But he is truly uh, an orphan. I mean, he has nowhere to go. Um, no one to watch out for him. Um, there's not a lot of people volunteering to adopt 17 or 18-year-old boys. so. Um, you know, he's one of those, he's a little bit older, 
uh, in that house, but he's been with us now for four years, um, and he's almost kind of like a, uh, an extra set of house parent uh, in, in some ways. I mean, he knows the rules more than the house parents know the rules uh, uh, to some degree. He doesn't follow them as well as the house parents sometimes. <laughs> but, but yeah, we, we try to keep the ages uh, pretty close to, to the same. There's a question in the back. Sometimes, sometimes they do. Um, we also have two caseworkers that we employ at the children's home. And these caseworkers are uh, employed not only to watch over the kids that we have uh, in our care, and by watch over I mean the, the case manager does things like uh, make sure they're the doctor that they need to see. I mean, they do kind of uh, uh, above and beyond what the house parent can do. They make sure that they're going to the right classes, and, and they have a lot of kind of I guess the broad overview of the welfare of the child. What they also do is they um, watch out after they leave our program. Now, the one thing that's great about this new generation is they love to be online. So one of the great things about keeping up with them is as long as you're Facebook friends or Instagram followers or whatever, it's pretty easy to kind of keep up to some degree with, with what's going on in their lives. Um, but we stay in, in pretty close communication with a lot of our kids. Now, there are some kids that are glad to go, and uh, you know we don't hear back from them for years until usually until they have children, and then they realize um, how much they appreciated uh, the children's home, and then they come back. It's not uncommon for uh, former residents to bring their children to go fish on the pond or to come back for Christmas just to kind of reminisce. I don't know if y'all have ever driven past your old home. I have, or it's not even there anymore, but I've taken my kids to show where I, I, I used to live anyhow, and uh, um, they do the same thing. So it's kind of one of those, um, we have a system set in place for our case managers to follow. In fact, they track every time that there's a, uh, um, a conversation or, or something with, with a former resident, uh, and it just kind of helps us know what's going on. Uh, it's hard to measure results of the children's home. I mean, it's hard to measure success in some ways. I mean, are those eight baptisms a measurement of success? Absolutely. Um, but what happens after they leave? And so we're really encouraged to find uh, you know, children that have left our program and that are stable and you know, happy, healthy adults. You know, I kind of feel like if I find a child or if I find out that a young man is you know, in the military serving or uh, that we've got a young man. Um, we, I just found out that we had a, a former resident who's um, in basic training, and, and I was kind of happy. Yeah, I mean, th there's something about that. Like, okay, you know, he's, he's kind of adapted to society. He's serving our country. You know, that's a win, and, and I'll, I'll take those wins. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a little bit loose. We don't have GPS trackers on all of them, and, and it's not like uh, – uh, it's not like maybe your mom or dad and as far as keeping up with them, but it's, it's regular for our kids to call home, to call uh, Robert Kimberly, our executive director. Uh, that happens all the time. So there's a couple different ways. The first is the state of South Carolina does a pretty good job of making sure that they can go to a, a state university. So um, most of our kids aren't going to Harvard. But you, you know they can go to Spartanburg Community College, so the state does a pretty good job of making sure that the tuition and books are are paid for. Um, sometimes we have a child that might leave our program uh, and decide to go to another university, and we actually have a fund set up at the children's home that's specifically set up to help pay for scholarships uh, for children that were um, former residents of the children's home or connected to the children's home. So right now we have a young girl who, um, great story, I think we're going to feature her probably, she lets us, uh, lets us feature her, uh, but she came to us probably two years ago, a uh, 16, 17 year old girl, um, complete orphan, the parental rights have been terminated, um, she had a smile on her face, 
Um, loved playing tennis. wasn't the best tennis player, but loved playing tennis. Uh, and uh, a family that volunteered at our uh, garage sale uh, ran into her and just fell in love with her and adopted her. Uh, adopted a 17-year-old girl. Can you imagine that? And, um, and so she went to live with them for you know, the last part of her high school year, graduated from Burns High School. And now she's going to North Greenville University um, and seems to be doing really well there. And we're helping. I mean, the children's home helps pay uh, for you know, part of her expenses. So um, you know, there's all sorts of ways out there. You, you know, it's kind of a, um, we can't pay for everything, but we can help. And, and so that's, um, uh, we've just been blessed with, with uh, the ability to help the, the few times that can happen. So that's a great question. So um, almost all of our kids come from the South Carolina Department of Social Services. Occasionally, one might come from the Department of Juvenile Justice, which basically means that the child committed a crime somewhere and went into that system. Uh, the juvenile justice and social service system are basically um, brother and sister. I mean, they're, they're almost the very same uh, program. Um, we also take private placements as well, so it's not uncommon for, for us to have uh, a call from you know, somebody that's here in North Carolina or South Carolina that just is having trouble with a child. And so for, for a small amount of time, we'll take that child in and kind of work with the parents uh, so that we can kind of iron that out. To answer your question directly, how do we work with them? Um, let me just talk about the funding first, and, and we'll go from there. So the state pays a per diem rate for each child. So every day that, that we have a child that's for uh, a level two group care, they pay X amount of dollars per day. Um, and that rate is always a source of, of heartache in some ways because uh, it, it just it hadn't been raised in, in a number of years. There is no way that an organization could function off just what DSS pays uh, per day. And so about half of the of our resources that we have come from DSS, and then half come through individuals, churches, uh, uh, corporations, and grants. You know, doing fundraising things like having the golf tournament uh, yesterday. So, um, just to let you know, it takes about a million dollars uh, is what our budget is at, at the children's home each year. So DSS comes up with about five hundred thousand, and then we have to go and raise five hundred thousand in order just to keep the doors open. And that might seem like a lot of money, because it is a lot of money. Um, but what happens is, in order to, before we can even take the first child, there's just a certain, uh, certain level of a home that we have to have. So for instance, our homes are very different than your homes. We have cameras in every hallway, um, a monitoring system. You know, our alarm system has to be kept, uh, has to be monitored 24 hours a day. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of things, um, just beyond the food and clothing and normal things that you would have to have as a family, just to run as an agency. Uh, I mean, it, it's probably $300,000 for us just to kind of have the minimal cost in place on January 1st uh, to be able to run. Um, and then you get into all the additional payroll and, and whatever else. I mean, we choose to go above and beyond the standards that the state puts forward. Uh, we don't have to, uh, but we choose to do things like we let our kids go on vacation every summer. And, and we take our kids to the beach and let them experience a normal family vacation as much as they can. Um, and so uh, they get to do things like go to the amusement park and water slides and, and stuff like that. OK, is the state paying for that? No, the state's not paying for that. But we, did, we, we just feel like that's an important part of a childhood. Um, does the, is the state going to pay for uh, playground equipment? No, the state's not going to pay for playground equipment on our campus. We've got to go and get funding for a slide. Um, and you know that's one thing. Uh, if you come out to the children's home, you've got a big basketball court. You've got a bunch of swings. And, and I didn't think a bunch of 15-year-olds would really care much about swings. They are out there every time uh, I drive by, it seems like. But some of that, they didn't have a play set growing up. So, 
uh, we, we try to go above and beyond um, as much as we can. And obviously funds are limited, meaning uh, the kids aren't eating out six times a week. I mean, you may, we have to budget and just like every other family. And sometimes uh, you get to order out for pizza, and that's great. And sometimes we're having leftovers tonight, you know. So um, we're, we're as frugal as we can be, and we have to be in, in some ways. I mean, even our uh, equipment that we use at the children's home, we have 55 acres. Well, I don't know how y'all mow your lawn, but I don't want to be out there with a push lawnmower uh, cutting 55 acres of grass. And so we've got a, an old Ford tractor, and, and it needs servicing every year, and it's a pain, but it's just a cost that we have to have. And, and the uh, state's not going to pay for that, but we've got to find a way to do that. So um, that's probably more uh, than, of an answer than you, even you were asking. But I, I would just say in regards to DSS, probably the bigger issue for us is the spiritual issue. Um, I, I hope and pray that we will always be able to um, take kids from the state that will have a, a partnership with them. But I'd be lying to you if I said that realistically, I feel like that's always going to happen. Um, we already see in other states that, that states are basically forbidding children's homes from uh, taking their kids to church. Uh, from allowing them to um, kind of have that religious atmosphere. And that's a problem. It's a problem for the state. It's a problem for everybody. I mean, if you were to take away the faith-based uh, group homes in South Carolina, how are you going to pay for all these kids? I mean, where's the money going to come from? Because you, we are all helping to provide for these children. So that's a problem. But certainly it's a problem just from our a spiritual standpoint. You know, I think it... it it breaks my heart to think that uh, and we don't force our kids to, um, what we tell our kids at church, you stand up when everybody else stands up, and you're quiet when everybody else is quiet. That's what we tell our kids. It just happens. I mean, God works through them when they start attending a church, and they open up, and they might be resistant at first, but over time, they develop relationships with their teenagers and teachers and and. And God works through them in, in amazing ways. So that's probably the scarier part to me, is what's going to happen 20 or 30 years down the road uh, with this partnership that we have. So, Sure. Nice, this condition is in many countries, more three or four in Africa. Right. Yeah. We have a three, four more in, uh, in, the, in the country that is for the child. You know? And then the problem is this: uh, often children with uh, problem negligent parent to abandon. You know. Uh, right. Nice, very big. Uh, right. I'll give you the address. Maybe you can. It's a website in internet. It's in English. Maybe you can help this uh, con the big condition. Absolutely. You, Absolutely. Because this condition is in, uh, in Africa now. It's in uh, uh, Honduras. You know. Mm -hmm. Write it, the address. write it down, no problem. Because I'm a leaver. So okay, okay. I'm, I'm a leaver. My mom has to work on every day in the church. I don't see Mr. Yeah. Philip. That's you know, right, that's right. Just, just write it down. You, and know, you know I was off on it, you know. All right, I think we're about to the end of our time. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to see me afterwards, and I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. I was, uh, I'll go into this. It was 5,000. Yeah.